Welcome to Hard Talk with me, Zainab Badawi. It's exactly a year since a historic power sharing agreement was signed between the civilians and military in Sudan after the fall of President Bashir. My guest in this exclusive interview is the civilian Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok. The world celebrated with the Sudanese people after the successful revolution. But has that euphoria now given way to harsh realities and unfulfilled expectations? Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok in Khartoum, welcome to Hard Talk. The euphoria at the removal of President Omar al-Bashid, how far is that really now a long distant memory? Thank you very much then for uh, having me on Hard Talk. Today marks the first anniversary of the signing of the constitutional document that paved the way for the establishment and the formation of the transitional government. And I think we have all the reason and the cause to celebrate the victory of the great Sudanese revolution. It came about because of the judicious and hard work of the young people, women, and uh, through that process, we toppled one of the most brutal dictatorships. And that is why we think we mark it with celebrating it. Also, this revolution has a one distinguishing factor. It has been very peaceful, provide many lessons for the world at large. Things in Sudan will never be the same again. And I think we are definitely moving in the right direction. All right, but there were a lot of negotiations to achieve that historic power sharing agreement between the civilians and the military. What are your relations like with the military? A bit uneasy or comfortable? Then, as you know, transitions are always messy. They are non-linear. They never travel in the same way. And this transition is probably one of the most challenging and complex transitions in our history. We had two or three transitions before, but this is the most, the most complex one. We are working on what we call the Sudanese model, which is a partnership between the civilian and the military. And I think it is working well. We are very realistic about it. There are some challenges and problems and all that, but by and large, we are making headways and we are working within that confinement and within that partnership in an excellent fashion, addressing all the challenges that are facing us together. But obviously not everybody is happy. In March, you survived an assassination attempt when the convoy you were travelling in was nearly blown up. How shaken were you by that? And do you know who was responsible? Then this revolution was or came about because of the huge sacrifice of our young people, of the entire nation. We lost so many lives. We have martyrs in this process. So my life is not much expensive to the cause of the nation. I took that as part of the contribution we are making to our, our nation. Yes, we started uh, the process long back of addressing and, and uh, having uh, an investigation on that assassination attempt. It is, of course, we know so well, coming from the uh, operatives of the former dictatorship, We've uh, arrested some people and the uh, investigation is continuing. We're getting some support and help from outside. COVID also derailed this process a little bit, but we are working on that. And I think this will never derail us from continuing and working forward in the interest of our people. You have, as part of your um, reforms, removed a series of controversial laws that had been introduced by the former Islamist regime of Umar al-Bashir. Uh, public order laws relating to women's freedoms, to apostasy and so on. A Sudanese legal expert, Wail Ali Said, says Sudan still has more work to abolish Bashir-era restrictions on personal freedoms and adopt international treaties and standards on the respect, and respect for human 
human and civil rights. You've got a lot more to do, haven't you, to try to Absolutely. undo what Absolutely. the regime did? This is, this is a 30 years of legacy. You cannot undo it overnight. We believe strongly we are moving in the right direction. We started by repealing those repressive laws. We went even further to uh, repeal all the laws that restrict uh, religious freedom, uh, human rights, and all this. We think we are moving in the right direction, but the road is a long road, and we are determined to get there. But you've got to strike the right balance, haven't you, Prime Minister? There are a lot of conservative elements in Sudan, many who supported the Islamism of Umar al-Bashir. And the National Congress Party, Bashir's former ruling party, says that there is now a battle between the secular, secularists and Islam in Sudan. And it's urging their supporters to go out on the streets. You've got a big problem on your hands. Not really. Actually, we believe the real struggle that is our people are facing is the struggling is a struggle for creating a better sudan sudan that respect its people its human rights sudan that is working on building a better economy a better place to live in i don't think our battle today is about religion the sudanese people has always been religious they have always respected their uh, their religion and all that but the real struggle for the people is on the economic front, on bringing peace to our people and all that. There are so many elements of the former regime want to push us in that direction, but our people understand this very well and, and know it so well, and nobody can push us in that direction. But really, I put it to you again, one famous cleric in Sudan, Abdul Hajj Yusuf, says bringing down this government, which has legalized apostasy and other wrongdoing, is a duty for any Muslim. You've, uh, you're now allowing the sale of alcohol again in the Sudan. That's upsetting a lot of people. You've got to tread very carefully. Then these are the distraction issues. We, we are not bothered with that. Abdul Hayy and his likes, these are a small minority. You can see the number of demonstrations that they call during uh, the last few weeks and so. The Sudanese people have, have come of age. They know so well what are their real battles and what are their real problems and challenges. So this is not taking us anywhere in that direction. All right, well look, as we said, a year after the revolution, but life is still tough for the Sudanese. The biggest headache you've got is the economy. Consumer prices, inflation is about 136%. Your external debt is about $60 billion. 60 million Sudanese are living in poverty, uh, food insecurity. 40% of youth are unemployed. What are you doing to try to solve all this? When you came into office, you said, I think with the right vision, with the right policies, we will be able to address the economic crisis. How much progress have you made? You see, uh, Zainab, we have inherited a very serious 30 years of bad legacy. As you rightly put it, collapsing economy on all fronts, all the statistics you've made, poverty, tax issues, uh, institutions, almost collapsing, collapsing banking sector and all that. But this year provided us an opportunity for reflection and we have put in place policies and programs that will help us address all these ills. We, we certainly moving in the, in the right direction. We negotiated with the uh, IMF a very ambitious uh, program that will pave the way for addressing the structural imbalances of the, of the economy, reforming the banking sector, certainly reforming the tax, addressing all the uh, imbalances, whether it is budget deficit or trade or uh, balance of payment and all that. We are moving in this respect in the, in the right direction. We know things are yet for our people to improve, yet our people to reap the benefit of this great revolution. But I confidently believe we are moving in the, in the right direction. But one big mystery which everybody's wondering about is how can you try to implement these economic reforms when you change your captain midship, the finance minister, Ibrahim al-Badawi, was among seven or eight key cabinet ministers who was removed from office in July. Why did you do that? You know, the reshuffle we did in July, it was motivated by three factors. Number one, 
This is a government that listened to the people, to the public. We had a huge demonstration on the 30th of June, marking the first anniversary of that uh, demonstration last year. And they demanded change on a number of fronts. The second reason is about teamwork. We would like to have ministers that will be working in, in a perfect teamwork within the cabinet, with the political uh, front and all that. But most importantly, it is also dictated by performance. The Minister of Finance and others, these are people implementing a program, not a personal agenda. So the program of the government remained the same, which was articulated following the great slogan of the revolution, freedom, justice and peace. Okay, we've only got interim replacements at the moment, particularly in the finance ministry. We've got a senior finance ministry official um, in charge. When are you going to nominate new ministers? You know, the, the challenge and probably also the beauty of this arrangement of the transitional government, the prime minister is not on his own entirely free to appoint the ministers. We have, according to the constitutional document, embarked on a consultation process with the forces of freedom and change, which is the leader of this change. All right, you, you refer to the process. FFC, which is the Forces for Freedom and Change, which is the umbrella coalition group of the civilian forces who were behind the revolution to remove Omar al-Bashir. All right, but one major financial impediment which has hampered Sudan's economic recovery and reconstruction is the fact that it still remains on the list of uh, the U.S., for the U.S. list of states that sponsor terrorism. The U.S. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said late in July he wants to remove Sudan from this list. He says it's a historic opportunity in its civilian transition and that this is something that may happen in the very, very near term. How soon? Do you know? We hope and we had hoped that this would have been lifted long back. You know, it is one of the major impediments and hurdles and challenges for us Sudan being uh, or facing the state uh, sponsored terrorism list. We have been working with the US government for a while now. We think we are getting closer to a conclusion on this. Delisting Sudan is a game changer. If we get out of that list, this will open the country for investment, will reintegrate Sudan in the international financial uh, institutions. You know, today, we are almost cut off from the financial institutions. We have very limited uh, correspondence banks. We, we, we certainly were punished because of this. We could not benefit from any assistance that has been given as grants to fight COVID-19, which we are suffering from like the rest of the world. So it compounded our problems, which is already in a bad state. We hope that with, with, with our friends in the, in the U.S. government, various departments, and certainly I, I very much appreciate the statement by uh, Secretary Pompeo on reaching a conclusion on this file sooner rather than later. Mm. As you mentioned, Sudan actually is one of the countries in Africa which has been worst affected by COVID-19, around 13, 14,000 cases and about 800 deaths. So, as you say quite rightly, that has been a, a huge um, uh, problem and exacerbated your economic situation. But apart from the economy, you've also got to meet the challenge of justice in Sudan. And I'll tell you what the Human Rights Watch East Africa Director, Jehan Henry, said in June. She said, one year on, victims of the bloody crackdowns have heard many promises but are yet to see any form of accountability, failure to deliver risks, betraying protesters, sacrifices and demands. We saw close on 100 people losing their lives initially in the revolution, another 120 in June when protesters took to the streets and they need justice and accountability for those who committed these killings. Certainly, we regret all the loss of life. <clears throat> we are working very hard in addressing this. But also, when we came, we made a very serious undertaking and commitment that we would like to work towards establishing a judiciary system that is credible, independent of any political interference. And that will take a while. We started this process 
as you know so well, the, the, the way we went a long way in addressing this by uh, trying some of the perpetrators, uh, the, the, the teacher who was the martyr who was killed in, uh, in the east of Sudan. But also we tried the former president himself, and he's behind bars. We are working on this, but again, COVID-19 derailed us for a while. But there are more than 11 court cases in the pipeline, and right. we are very certain and determined that will, 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 will be, uh, they will be tried and the perpetrators will, will be brought to justice. We have established, as you know, uh, an investigation committee headed by one of the, our very respectful uh, lawyers. They are doing their work. They continue to report to us on their progress. Okay. But again, we do not want to be seen and definitely not want to interfere in the work of an independent investigation committee. We hope they will finish their investigation soon and that will pave the way for any trials and bringing those who committed these crimes right. to justice. And can you state categorically, because as you know, there are allegations that forces linked to the military council, which is part of the transitional government apparatus, could have been responsible at least for some of the killings that took place on June the 3rd. You will pursue the perpetrators regardless of where they are, even if they are within your structures of power today. I do not want to pass any judgment on the issue of the uh, independent investigation, but certainly we are saying it categorically that anybody who is found to be implicated on those crimes will be brought to justice. There is no... Uh, also related to the issue of justice is obviously the conflict in regions of Sudan like Darfur and there are still outstanding claims of justice that must be addressed but there's also great concern about a resurgence of violence and I tell you what the UN Office for the Coordination of Humanitarian Affairs has said the escalation of violence in different parts of the Darfur region is leading to increased displacement compromising the agricultural season causing the loss of lives and livelihoods and driving growing humanitarian needs what is your government doing to try to ensure sure that violence doesn't return in a major way to conflict-ridden areas of Sudan like Darfur. Certainly, again, we, we, we regret any loss of life during this period. But the reason that we have this uh, resurgence in the, conflict, the ethnic conflict in Darfur and few other places in the, in the country, like in Port Sudan, Kassala and Kadugli, these are, by and large, the legacy of the former regime which is incited ethnic groups against each other. These groups have been living together in harmony for centuries. But the former regime citing them for survival and therefore uh, genocide is a case in point. Since we came, we started addressing this issue and certainly we are making very serious uh, progress. We've linked to the IDPs, the internally displaced persons, uh, and, and uh, we started a peace process in Juba with the uh, forces of the armed struggle. Right. We think this violence can, can, can be addressed within the broader context of the peace process that is this time is built on addressing the root causes of the conflict, looking at issues of uh, economic and social development, marginalization, addressing issues of uh, legal compensation, claims okay. and all that, addressing transitional justice, and we are working on all this. Because you absolutely have to, you refer to the peace process in Juba, the capital of neighbouring South Sudan, because political marginalisation, I just tell you what one Sudanese journalist, Zainab Mohammed Saleh, writes about how such groups, such as the people of Darfur, have faced discrimination and marginalisation and are often described in derogatory terms. Just in a word, you absolutely say that they will be included in the power apparatus of Sudan. The marginalization of these groups will end. Absolutely, I can categorically All right, that. and one just very quick answer on this. People have focused a lot on the trial of Umar al-Bashid. As you say, he's behind bars. Could he be sent to the ICC, the International Criminal Court, where he's um, been indicted on alleged war crimes relating to Darfur? Absolutely, he could. But as you know, the ICC is, is a court of last resort. If we could not try him 
in the country, then we are very uh, happy and certain to, for him to face trial anywhere in, in, in the world. But certainly we are uh, talking, we are uh, uh, in good contacts with the ICC, and uh, there is good cooperation between us. And I think once we have uh, certain, uh, our judiciary system is, is in place and it is credible, and I think we are confident that we can try all of them here. Failing this process, all we right. have no issues in sending all the... You have... Yes. Okay, sorry to interrupt you, though, because we're running short of time, and I have a couple of more things I need to ask you. You have said that Sudan, under this new transitional government, can reassert itself and be an effective player regionally. One big problem in the region at the moment has been created by the Grand Ethiopian Renaissance Dam, which is using waters from the Blue Nile on which both Sudan and Egypt depend for their agriculture. There has even been, according to the International Crisis Group, it says that countries could be drawn into conflict over the dam. Just state for us quite clearly what Khartoum's position is. Certainly, our position is very clear. We know that this Ethiopian Great uh, Renaissance Dam brings so many benefits to us, to uh, Ethiopia and all that, and we've supported it from the beginning. But we have major concerns linked to the issue of the safety of our dams and our people. We have over 20, people, uh, 20 million people living on the uh, Nile, Blue Nile Basin. But more importantly, we have a small dam just close to the borders of Ethiopia, which is the, the, the gear is 10 times bigger than this dam. So the operation of this dam and its safety is linked to us getting information on a daily basis. So the filling and the operation of the dam make it very important that we reach a trilateral agreement between Ethiopia, Egypt, and Sudan to regulate the ferris filling of the dam and to also uh, make sure that the yeah. operation is done within the confines of the international law. We said okay. here. Could there be a conflict very quickly? Could there be a conflict over this? Are you worried? Our position is very clear. We do not believe and think there is any way out of this but to negotiate. So we think there is definitely a room for negotiation, for reaching a settlement and an agreement, particularly now that we appreciate the leadership of the African Union under the leadership of President Ramaphosa of South Africa. And we are happy to see this motto of African solutions to African problems guide us in this process. All right, very quickly and finally, Despite all the problems we've been discussing, can the people of Sudan and the world be optimistic about Sudan's future? Briefly. I am a very optimist person. I think, yes, we can be optimistic. I think Sudan brings hope in this region, which is riddled with uh, conflicts and tension and all that. Sudan case is providing an opportunity for a success story in making. And if we're getting it here right, it has far-reaching implications, repercussions, and multiplier effect in the entire region. So we would like to see, relying on the support of our people, our friends, and partners, supporting this and rewarding this great success revolution of the Sudan and moving with us working, moving forward. Prime Minister Abdullah Hamdok in Khartoum, thank you very much indeed for coming on Hard Talk. Thank you.